Hello and welcome to all the Centurions and Legates out there. I'm Joe. Here with me is my co-host, the Military Tribune, Dan. Hello and greetings. And this episode of Rome is very mixed bag. Let's get one thing out of the way. At one point, one of the antagonists of this episode addresses Varinus as Captain. And I forgot about this. And for years, I didn't really pay much attention to it because I watch this show pretty often. Sometimes once every two years. Sometimes once every year. And no, that is not acceptable. I complained about this sort of thing with Rome, with the Chosen series. I mean, I'm going to complain here because, no, this is historically inaccurate. The rank of captain was not a thing. It's Centurion. Centurion. It's not si difficile que ça. This is not very hard. Apparently it is. Yeah. Now, another thing that's very difficult, apparently, is writing good female drama. Oh, boy. Because the drama of Atia in this episode is so boring and tedious to watch. She's having drama with Tymon, who wants to have fun time with her. She's having drama where her daughter's fictional husband is concerned that's not much fun just go with the historic stuff don't go inventing stuff don't go inventing historic figures that's not, like when it comes to octavia please don't then there's yeah there's more the drama of atia acting like a queen i'm not sure about the historiosity of that then there's the drama yeah like the thing the stuff with atia is just, you have a good actress, you have a good cast of characters, for the most part, and actors and actresses all around her. Just play to the history. Stop going, riding roughshod over it. It's not fun or interesting. And it just makes me think, you know what Ken Follett did with the characters of Aliana, Ellen, even Marfa, Tom Builder's daughter, like, you look at Ken Follett. He could write really good female characters. You even have Tolkien. He wrote great female characters. And if you want historic fiction, Nigel Tranter spent, what, 50 years, I think, till he was 80, writing great female characters. Oh, my gosh. His depiction of Gruach, the greatest depiction in the history of the Lady Macbeth, as many know her. You look at his depiction of how he wrote each of the women in Robert the Bruce's life. It is fascinating. So, yeah. Where the female characters in this episode are concerned, for the most part. It's not very interesting. We might as well be watching a teen girls sitcom, as you put it earlier. Yeah. Like, sometimes the writing is good. Other times it's not very interesting. And it's just tedious to watch. We often go skip, skip, skip. Where the noble women are concerned in the Rome series. It's they they easily could have done better. They just didn't aim to do better. And that's something that I think that is not very good. And I, I <clears throat> but the thing is you have, for example, Colleen Nikolov, who wrote the novel Antony and Cleopatra, and yeah, her depiction of Antonius isn't always the best. But her depiction of the female drama, to some extent, for example, that of Octavia, is a lot more true to history and a lot more interesting. Honestly, if we were to just take the Antonius of this series, along with Polo, Varinus, and their drama, combine it with her depiction of, maybe not Caesar, because this depiction of Caesar is a lot more accurate to history, the one from the Rome series, but her depiction of Octavius... To a limited extent. Um, well, actually, the two Octavius should be combined. But her depiction of Livia, Octavia, and whatnot, and a lot of the noble women, you combine the two depictions, and you'd have the perfect Rome series. But the thing is, enough about that. As for female drama, the drama surrounding Niobe is a lot more interesting because she's having to ward off her former violator turned semi lover and what is a very complicated sort of relationship. Or her brother-in-law, as we also know him, Evander, 
Evander took advantage of her while Varinus was gone to war. And since then, she's had a weird kind of relationship with him, giving birth to his son and otherwise just causing nothing but drama for her family. But the thing is, she wants to push Evander away now that Varinus is back, but she's too weak to do it at first. But Evander leaves when Verena Major shows up. Verena Meyer, since there's no J in Latin, so Verena Meyer, or Major as we say today, is often the no child, often defying one parent or the other and otherwise being a brat throughout the series. Very good actress, but man, the writing is sometimes annoying. But here it isn't. So you have mother and daughter drama a little. But you can understand the daughter's position here. But Niobe believes in the worst in her husband for the moment. And that brings us, I think, to an end with most of the women. Because I understand that uh, you, in order to show the full per perspective of the, the situation, you do have to bring in the female pers perspective of a uh, woman of all ranks to get the... The full ex Roman experience, yeah. Yeah. But and the problem but, is, they get it right with Niobe, but they never quite get it right with Octavia and Atia. It really is more of a drag. Yeah. And you can tell in history dramas and movies when something's not really accurate. Now, sometimes you get some stuff that's not entirely accurate in terms of some stuff, say, Centurion or Kingdom of Heaven... But when they really veer off the beaten path of history, you really can't tell because it doesn't become fun anymore. It becomes a drag to watch. Now, that's not always true, but often that aside. Getting to the men now. Cezal orders Varinus and Polo to go and advance to the city until resistance is met. And if there is no resistance, to enter the city and nail Caesar's proclamation to the Senate door, which was often something people did. And what happens is that the two take off. Caesar notes that Varinus isn't very happy. He's sullen and morose. Antonius explains the situation with Varinus a little, just that he's a Stonewall Catonian and that he doesn't believe in turning on the Republic, but that nonetheless, Varinus will remain loyal. On the other hand, now, by this time, Caesar had crossed the Rubicon, and Pompeius Magnus only had maybe three or so legions, I believe is what the show explains. I'm pretty sure that's historically accurate. Most of them were Caesar's men or raw recruits, and thus not reliable troops. The raw recruits fled at the sight of the scouts. It's at least according to this show. I'd have to do more research on the era to determine that. As to the others, they're Caesar's men, and they did turn to Caesar's side. So that by the time Caesar was advancing towards Rome, he had started with one legion and beefed his ranks up with just about every legion that was supposed to defend Rome. Honestly, this was not a good situation for the Pompeian faction, or the senatorial faction, we should say, because Pompeius is little more than a creature of the likes of Scipio and Cato at this point. So we'll call it the Catonian faction, as that's probably more apt. The Catonian faction had control over the city for the moment, but they had no means of defending it. So Pompeius Magnus, as military advisor, suggested there's no other choice but to leave the city. Otherwise, you have to surrender. Cato's not keen on this and doesn't like it and whines and cries and and whines some more. And that's pretty accurate to history, I think. Cato was that sort of person. He was not very likable. And Pompeius Magnus argues with him a little, and they decide to leave the city. Before um, really fleeing proper, Pompeius would have the gold that was stored in the treasury, kind of hidden away. But this is where, in the next episode, we'll see that Caesar's lock kicks in. Caesar was infamous for his lock. And the gold was found and given over to him. So, 
<laughs> Caesar had the entire treasury of the Republic, or res publica, as we should call it, the public thing of the Romans. The res publica's treasury was given over to Caesar without a shot or a sword being drawn, I should say. This was a major factor that tipped things in Caesar's part favor because he could now levy this wealth towards raising new legions. Not good for Pompeius Magnus, who has to rely on the personal wealth and fortunes of the individual senators and on the eastern provinces, which he decides to strip semi-bare because he needs money to raise armies to fight Caesar. That said, having fled the city and with the Senate squabbling, or I should say the grumpy old men outside of Rome, because once outside of Rome, they're not really a Senate. They're just a group of grumpy old men. Squawking? Yeah, squabbling and whining and crying. The only ones really worth respecting are probably Marcus Tullius Cicero. And... Now we get to the other womanly drama, that of the Brutai, or I should say the Junii. Now the truth is, the Brutus family in history were a very clever and savvy lot. You had Decimus Brutus, who was one of the lieutenants of Caesar. Decimus Brutus was someone who sometimes, apparently, according to one historian, who wrote about the many killers and conspirators against Caesar, that Decimus often went native when in Gaul dressing up, and even adopting a lot of the fashion. He was one of Caesar's two right-hand men, alongside Marcus Antonius. And Brutus expected to inherit to a large extent. Turns out, by the time Caesar was assassinated, Caesar had turned his favor more towards Octavius. But the reality is that Decimus had a pretty close bond with Caesar. And if there's any historic figure Caesar said, it would have been him. This was the Brutus that he really did favor. Marcus Junius Brutus was not the favorite that Decimus Brutus was. The two were cousins, but the one who was a lot more of a close personal friend and semi-surrogate son was Decimus. Although Marcus could have been a, an, a surrogate son of sorts, given Caesar's relationship with Servilia. Brutus's mom. So, well, the trouble is that both Brutuses were kept very close to Caesar. They are both wed to his, to him almost. Both turned traitor. But the one that would have really bitten, would have really clawed Caesar's heart from his chest, was Decimus betraying him. Decimus is the one who also betrayed not out of high-minded values like Marcus Junius Brutus might have, but out of greed and and jealousy, because Decimus wanted to be the one, the first man of Rome. So, this is where, by removing Decimus from the series, they're really crippling themselves as a drama, and this is always the problem with any TV show or movie about this period. You need Decimus Brutus. He is really the one who's the grand traitor and the kind of antagonist to Peter. To mm. Caesar, I mean, not Peter. Ugh. What am I thinking? P with Peter, it's more Nero. Sorry, stupid mistake. But uh, to uh, Death Myth is essentially Judas. In this situation, yes. And you need that grand traitor. And he, it was him and Cassius who really organized the conspirators from what I've read. And so you need him. That aside, the reality is that the Brutus family was very clever. You had Servilia who lined up on one side. Now, the reality is Decimus is very firmly in the Caesar camp. But it's possible that maybe Marcus and Servilia weren't sure he'd really vouch for them if they went with Pompeius. Not to mention, you can't really separate Servilia from Caesar because more than Decimus, who would be the closest person to Caesar? His mistress. 
So it's only natural she stays where Caesar will be in Rome. Now, here's the thing. If Caesar is in Rome, Servilia will have access to him and could plead the case of her son. But when in the field, she can't really do that. But Decimus could. So you have two of this family perpetually with Caesar at all times, no matter what. When Caesar is off to the Senate, because Decimus is part of the Senate, under Caesar, you know, Decimus is there. When Caesar is off with the military, typically Decimus would often be with him. And when he's at home or off having fun, Servilia is with him. So they had Caesar cornered. All that was lacking was secure ties with Pompeius. So that's why Marcus had to go with Pompeius. This was not an emotional decision like it's portrayed in the show. This was a very political decision. This was a very cunning choice. This was not an emotionally driven decision. This was an intellectually and kind of politically driven choice. Because while Cicero was fairly friendly with the family, you know, you, you can't really depend on him because he's not of the family. So Marcus going with Pompeius means that should Pompeius win, Marcus will plead the case of Decimus and Servilia. But should Caesar win, then you get Decimus and Servilia who will plead the case of Marcus. And if they should also plead the case of Cicero, they get Cicero, uh, the finest orator, lawyer, and senator, and the greatest of the moderates, in their pocket. So this was a very important decision to make. This was not some emotional decision and argument between a family member or two. No, 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 no. They, they were very firmly, okay, here's our goal. Our goal is to stay alive because Caesar and Pompeius have basically put us in an impossible situation. We need to figure out how to get around this so that we all come out with our fortunes and our lives intact and maybe with Cicero in our debt. The truth is they probably had quite the dinner discussion regarding this. Like, what do we do? How do we handle this? Somebody's got to stay behind to also communicate with Demosimus to an extent. And it can't be Marcus. So it has to be Servilia. But you need someone to keep an eye on Cato and the others so that they don't turn Pompeius against the Brutus family. When, because you, Pompeius could sometimes be pretty brutal. So you need Marcus to go with Pompeius. So... In this way, they clinch both sides. The Brutus clan was never really a Caesarian or a Pompeian faction. Like, they were never really on either side. They were on their side. And it makes sense. Both sides had plunged them into a terrible position. Because the, the Brutus family was very strongly allied with Caesar. But on the other hand, they're wedded to the Senate. And so they have to side with the Senate. Basically... The Catonian faction and the Caesarian one put the Brutus family in an impossible decision. So they made lemonade out of lemons. Anything you want to add? There have been times in history where families had to make such decisions, such important political and military decisions. Yep. You mentioned the Sanada earlier. Yeah, although the difference is, the difference is, the Brutus family were thrust into this. Whereas the Sanada, rather than being thrust into it, put themselves into the middle of it and tried to play every side against each other a lot of the time. Except for Sanada Nobushige Yukimura, who was the greatest of their family, the Lord of the Underdogs, as some call him. He became one of the greatest samurai and bushi who ever lived because he was that honorable a gent. He was one of the most honorable men in Japanese history. And he would not turn his back on a losing faction, regardless of his family going, okay, they've already lost, give up. Time for you to come back to the family. No, he refused to accept surviving, outliving his liege lords. So even though his liege lords had led him to defeat, he still decided to perish for them. 
So Sanada Yukimura was a very admirable man. The rest of his family, not so much. But the only thing that Sanada would do is guarantee the survival of his children and his wife. And some of his loyal retainers. But he himself would not surrender or retreat. The difference is the Brutus family were not as noble. Or, or as snake-like as some Sanada. But ultimately the Brutus can't land was a very interesting if um, important one in Roman history. And the Romans knew this. As to Varinus and Pullo, they would advance as fast as they could towards the city, running into one group of Roman troops, just a couple of boys who fled at the sight of them. And they would advance until they also ran into some soldiers who were driving what they believed at first to be a shipment of grain. Turns out it wasn't. They didn't know that. And this is where the captain mistake was made, which is just... Ugh. But Varinus then slaughters these guys, except for one of them who, would, who outfoxes them and retreats and flees. Varinus then forces them to continue on to Rome, with Pullo mocking his every comment about the sanctity of Rome. Pullo also ends up along the way giving womanly advice, well, advice about women to Varinus, which is pretty humorous at a few points. And it nearly ends up getting Pullo's throat slit. And I don't blame Varinus. V Pullo kind of had it coming. Uh, because of YouTube, I can't really repeat a lot of what's said. It's very crude. Um, that aside, the truth of the matter is that the two also discuss the stars and astronomy and whatnot in what are some pretty good scenes, mostly bonding scenes between the two. But when they arrive before the, the gates of Rome, uh, Varinus is fed up and tired and just offended by the lack of courage of the Catonian faction. But on the other hand, tactically and strategically, there's it makes complete sense that they have to flee. So Varinus is thinking that the gods may have abandoned Rome. Polo mocks this and doesn't agree and thinks the gods are pretty much with Caesar. And gets angry because he wants to go back for Irene, the girl he saw earlier with the other Roman soldiers, the enemy Pompeian soldiers or Catonian soldiers, I should say. And Varinus and him squabble like a married couple. They advance into the city. Varinus decides to hack with it after pinning the orders, well, the proclamation of Caesar to the Senate doors, and decides to desert. And as he puts it, I'm a traitor and a rebel, so why not a deserter as well? You know, considering everything... He makes a good point. Like, why not? At this point, you're already screwed. Your honor means nothing. Might as well throw in desertion while you're at it. Polo, for his part, doesn't agree, but accepts the sword of Arenas and takes off to go find Irene, deciding to semi-desert himself. Because why not? There's a lot of gold there that he found, but he doesn't forget to also rescue Irene. Now, the battle scene where they come to her rescue against her captors, those who've enslaved her earlier, in that scene, it's very fascinating because you kind of see Polo from the point of view of Irene at one point in that scene. And the way Polo looks is like Gauvin. He looks like a knight in shining armor. No, he does. You, you can't have seen, missed how the, it worked with the camera and whatnot. Looking upwards, like from her downward perspective, and the sun's pretty much almost behind him, and he's just magnificent. He seems like a knight in shining armor. And what's interesting about Polo is that he never has been. But what's fascinating about him is that, as a character, is that Irene and Varinus always believed in the best in him. And for the most part, they believe in the best in him and love him unconditionally. Faults, warts, and all. So that what happens is that Polo has never been that knight, but 
seeing himself through their eyes throughout the series makes him want to be that knight in shining armor, so to speak. And I'm using poetic parlance there. So that Polo begins to better himself and improve himself because po people believe in the best in him. And like the beast from Beauty and the Beast, he decides, I want to be like that. You know, these people believe in me and love me. I want to be like that. I want to be the man that they think I am. So that, ironically, he becomes the man they know him to be, that he could be deep down, even though he doesn't think he is that like that. But he is deep down. So what happens is he continuously betters himself as an individual and as a person. So that with Polo, you get one of the most beautiful character development stories of the entire Rome series. And some of the best writing I've ever seen in any drama. Him and Verenus have the best writing almost in any drama. There's almost no drama that can compare with their writing. Except for maybe the, let me think, the Hercules Legendary Journeys writing of Herc in Season 5. Or even se the end of Season 4 in throughout Season 5. Herc in, that's, in those two parts of the series is just, yeah. And maybe the some of the writing in Dunya. The Korean TV drama. But really, Rome has some really good writing. So, that being said, Varinus reconciles with Niobe, whom, in a scene that later gets retconned out towards the end of the season, which makes no sense. I mean, this is supposed to be a history drama. How can you retcon out a scene? I don't understand. No, I honestly don't. The thing is, there's a scene where Niobe admits that she's not been faithful to Varinus. And Varinus forgives her. In what is one of the most moving and beautiful scenes. And throughout the rest of the season, he's going to take steps to try to have a rapprochement and try to retain her affection. He realizes that marriage is not the end of the road, but is a much bigger journey. So what he does is he forgives her for cheating on him. Because she admits she was not faithful. She has not been faithful to him while he was away. Almost since the beginning. And Varinus tells her the past is gone. We start again. Now where this is going to be reckoned out, spoilers alert, is going to be in regards to the assassination of Caesar. At that point, Varinus is told she's not going to faithful to him. And turns around and goes to, you know, have a fight with her. Now, if it's just in the matter of Lucius, her son, that'd be one thing. But we know that's because of her cheating and the matter of Lucius. But that also leads me to the creative decision of killing her off the way they did, which made no sense to my mind. It was really bad writing. But we'll get to that when we get to that. But, yeah. So, this episode's a mixed bag. The Atian Octavia stuff is really bad. The Varinus and Polo stuff is generally really, really, really good. The Caesar stuff is always good in this series. Like, almost doesn't matter to Caesar. Like, if it's Julius Caesar or... Octavius Caesar, or I should say Augustus Caesar, to an extent, the writing is usually really good. Well, actually, Simon Wood's Augustus is way better, and the writing is almost re is, is better with him than even Julius Caesar, to an extent. But, yeah. So how are you going to rate this episode? Oh, boy. Because you've... You've mentioned the two extremes, but overall, oh boy. Shall I go first? I'll go two and a half, simply because the uh, woman's drama drags it down. But you said two and a half, that's above average. Verinus and Polo? Yeah. I'm going to say... Uh, 1.1 1. 1. 
Hmm. I am really not impressed with the Atia stuff. I am really not impressed with the Captain Mistake. Now, I could watch this episode and actually just skip every scene except Verena's and Polo. But taking it as a whole, it's like... or And also the Pompeia scenes are pretty good. So, like, taking the... Basically, all the scenes with the men and Niobe. And it's a pretty good episode. But the problem is that a lot of the episode is dominated by the women drama of the upper classes of Rome. The female drama drags it down and makes... And there's a lot of scenes with them. And it's really annoying. It's tiring. When I know they can write better than this, we know for a fact female characters who are not warriors can be well written. And they're actually really easy to write. And I'm talking from the point of view of a writer. It's easy. Anyone can do it. The trouble is, do you want to? And all I can conclude here is that they didn't want to. In regards to Octavia and Atia. The drama between the women could have been more interesting. Like, I don't mind an atia Servilia rivalry. That could be interesting. You could put that. Heck, you could put an atia calpurnia rivalry. That would have been even more interesting to an extent. Although, poor Calpurnia. On the other hand, the thing is, they really should have leaned into Octavia being the perfect woman. Because then you're going to have Octavia just going, Mother, please don't. Please don't. Ah. So that... At, yeah, you can put Atia as the abusive mom. Lean into that. But then, you got to bear in mind, Octavia later gets power over her mother. But Octavia is the one who's all forgiving. But one has to bear in mind... Now, this is where Colleen McCullough does it really well. In their... Throughout her stories of this period of Rome, Octavia is the perfect woman. And you see, you almost see her as a little girl grow up into a beautiful, voluptuous young woman. But throughout her life, you get people telling her horrid stuff about Antonius. Like, Antonius drove, beat his first wife almost to death. And then drove her to suicide. Oh, he would never. He's too nice for that, says Octavia. He would never. Don't insult Antonius. He's just a big bear, essentially. And then you get Octavia, who, when she's thrust into the position of marrying Antonius, is actually really excited about it. And is starry-eyed and like a girl in love, even though she's almost 30. And she bears Antonius several children, and Antonius actually gets a little taken with her. You know, he's like, wow, I have the perfect Roman wife. And one has to bear in mind, Octavia is a very complex character in McCullough's stories. So... This is where she obviously had an easy time writing this character. Now, if you want to say, well, that's because she's a female writer. She obviously knows women better than most men would, and so can easily write them. Not going to put up too much argument here. That can frequently be the case. But I've also seen and read books written by women where they really could not understand women and did not know how to write them. And where... You're just left going, have you ever spoken to another lady? Like, what are you, what's in your head? But I've also seen some male writers who can't write male characters to save their lives. But then again, I've seen those who can write male characters really excellently. I've seen men who could write female characters so darn well. Nigel Tranter, for example. Robert E. Howard. Tolkien. Mark Twain. Like, the list goes on and on. So, one has to bear in mind, one of the writer, best writers of male characters was the first novelist, Murasaki Shikibu, or Shikibu Murasaki, to respect Japanese tradition of putting the surname ahead of the name. You know, she wrote some great male characters. But she was a lady. And a lady with some minor harassment 
and attempted, um, yeah. And Shikabu Murasaki still wrote some pretty valiant, noble male characters, but also some pretty nasty ones. So overall, the thing is, this episode should have been better, I think. It's, in my opinion, a study in some mediocrity and some great writing. And, yeah. But the dialogue's always really good. Even the Atia dialogue and whatnot is really good. Even though I don't like all the scenes because of the writing. But I do like the dialogue. So, yeah. Mixed bag. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button to stay tuned for our next episode.